welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channel's television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Court orders interim forfeiture of more properties linked to former Minister of Petroleum, Dizani Alison Madweke, valued at 2.6 billion naira. President Buhari meets with security chiefs, orders intensified operations to end renewed attacks in the northeast and other security challenges across the country. Federal government identifies scientific audience measurement as major factor in ongoing broadcast digitization process in Nigeria. And surviving suspects in the Barcelona van attack testify in court, say plan was to use explosives against key monuments in the city. Just a quick reminder that for more on our top stories and others, please visit our website, channelstv.com and youtube.com forward slash channelsweb. You can also watch us on the go on your mobile device. Log on to m.channelstv.com or download the Channel TV app for Android, iOS and Windows phones from their respective stores. The Channel TV and Channels 24 app will give you access to news and updates. You also have access to the eyewitness feature with which you can share those pictures, videos or news of happenings around you. Just install the app, then tap and swipe to reveal the menu and follow the instructions. The Federal High Court in Lagos has ordered the interim forfeiture of assets valued at 2.6 billion naira linked to former Petroleum Minister Dizani Alison Madweke. The EFCC is alleging that the assets which were seized from different states across the country are the proceeds of corruption. In the documents put before the court, the EFCC says that it received an intelligence report in 2016 against one Donald Chidi Amambo and the former Petroleum Minister. The commission then conducted a search warrant at the premises and offices of Mr. Amambo and recovered an updated report titled Highly Confidential Attorney Work Product, August Report, end of quote. The report allegedly contains a list of 18 companies and several properties located in the United Kingdom, Nigeria and the USA. The EFCC claims that during the course of investigations, Mr. Amangbo claimed that the registered 18 companies to assist Mrs. Dizani Alison Madweke in holding titles of certain properties. The properties are listed as 21 mixed housing units comprising eight terrace units of four bedrooms each six three-bedroom apartments and another property located at Thorburn Street in the of Lagos. The EFCC listed all four companies as respondents alongside the former Petroleum Minister and her acquaintance, Mr. Donald Amambo. The head of legal of the EFCC's Lagos office, Mr. Anselm Ozioko, also told the court that some documents from a commercial bank in the country confirmed that payments for all the properties were at the instance of Mrs. Alison Madweke. The agency was able to convince the trial judge, Justice Abruzazik Anka, to grant their plea for an interim forfeiture of the assets. On August the 7th, the Federal High Court in Lagos ordered the final forfeiture of a property on Banana Island, Lagos, allegedly acquired by the former Petroleum Minister, valued at $37.5 million. Pardon. The court also ordered the sums of $2.7 million and $84 million naira realized as rents on the property be equally forfeited to the federal government. 11,000, that's the number of displaced persons known to be living in IDP camps in Adamawa State at the height of the Boko Haram attacks. But the figure has drastically reduced since many of them started moving back to their homes. Our next report captures the efforts of some of the IDPs to make a living in Mahori. Once home to thousands of displaced persons, camps in Adamawa State are becoming deserted as people return to their communities. From five camps which sheltered over 11,000 people, there are only two such camps in the state. Malkohe Camp in Yola South local government area is one of the two left with less than 1,000 inhabitants. For those still here, the pity party is over and they're beginning to take advantage of available resources, the most accessible being arable land around their environment. Some of the IDPs now grow a number of vegetables for their consumption. Others are opting for small businesses such as cutting of hair, 
tailoring and selling fruits and other food items. With aid no longer commensurate with their needs, the IDPs say fending for themselves is preferable to depending on handouts. It's better to learn you how to take it, how to catch a fish. So we we better to we we uh, they have they, we are praying to them we are appealing to them to train us uh, skills or to give us something so that we can restart our business from nearby bushes women fetch firewood for cooking to augment food aid from the community in the area of health a clinic funded by the Adamawa state primary health care agency provides health care services including delivery and prescription drugs most cases here is fever and sometimes we have diarrhea cases but we have enough drugs here to give them the role of donor agencies is evident here clean water is in sufficient supply there's enough space for the young to be children. It's mostly playtime because the nursery and primary school set up by the Nigerian military is on holiday. However, some of the older students are hopeful that their education will not be interrupted. I want to go my help me or with money, I won't go to school. Because I finished my secondary school, I won't go to university or and or diploma. The IDPs say, despite support from local and international agencies and security from the relevant agencies, no amount of time spent here makes it feel like home. They desire to return to their familiar environment at the slightest opportunity with resources to rebuild their lives back home. Well, let's cross over to Abuja now. Here's Linda Akibe. Linda. Hello, Ijoma. In order to ensure success in the ongoing de-radicalization and reintegration of repentant Boko Haram members in the Northeast, the Kuka Center, a non-governmental humanitarian organization, is asking the federal government to first address the concerns of victims of insurgency. The founder of the center, Bishop Matthew Kuka, while addressing a forum of key players on the federal government's reintegration program in Abuja, highlighted some of the challenges facing victims of insurgency, which includes lack of food, shelter, and security in their communities. In September 2015, the National Defense Headquarters inaugurated the Federal Government's Operation Safe Corridor, initiative which grants an amnesty to repentant Boko Haram members and reintegrates them back into society without facing persecution. It's actually an ideology. Almost two years on, this National Stakeholders Conference on Reintegration in the Northeast aims to examine the successes and challenges of that initiative and make recommendations. As well, reintegration, the initiative has successfully implemented voluntary vocational training for repentant Boko Haram members. There are 96 ex-combatants comprising 95 male and one female in the camp. Prior to this, Six S combatants have successfully gone through the program and have been reunited with their families since June this year and are presently undergoing further training with NDE Skill Acquisition Training Center in their respective states. In Nigeria. For the Kuka Center, the success of the reintegration program will be determined, however, by a variety of factors. A national a framework to deal with the issues of the radicalization must address the practical life and death issues that can sustain the, you know, the faith of people. And our challenge and our responsibility, and this is why I'm very happy with the way and the great amount of work that the center has done, um, by going and insisting and focusing on victims as opposed to those with the power. The anger is there. There are grievances that have been accumulated historically over the years, either against individuals, against the government, or against institutions. So I think that when you want to address the issue of reintegration, both of Boko Haram members and even of victims, the government really has to also address the concerns of the local communities. There are currently two million internally displaced people in the Northeast. 
victims of insurgency who constantly depend on humanitarian assistance for their survival. And therefore, participants at this conference are calling on the government to urgently resolve this crisis once and for all. Away from issues concerning the Northeast, the Minister of Information and Culture, Mr. Lai Mohammed, has identified scientific audience measurement as a vehicle that will enable the process of broadcast digitization reach its goals in Nigeria. He was speaking today at the third international summit on digital broadcasting in Nigeria, hosted by the Broadcasting Organization of Nigeria, Bonn in Lagos. The minister pointed out that the lack of a scientific audience measurement system has resulted in underinvestment in Nigeria's broadcasting industry. The chairman of Bonn, Mr. John Momo, who is represented by the vice chairman of Bonn, Haji Saar Ibrahim, wants government to be a strong support for the movement from analog to digital broadcasting by providing impactful policies for the industry. Our correspondent, Loretta Chiogo, reports. Media delegates and the Minister for Information, Culture and Tourism, Mr. Lai Mohammed, arriving for the third international summit on digital broadcasting in Nigeria. The mission here is simple. Industry players, regulators and other stakeholders must sit to discuss the gains and challenges of the terrestrial television switchover from analog to digital. The Minister of Information and Culture, Mr. Lai Mohammed, declares the summit open by identifying scientific audience measurement as the oil that will grease the wheels of digital success. The federal government has already taken a critical long-term decision to support the Nigerian creative and entertainment industry by ensuring and funding the inclusion of a middleware that is capable of scientific audience measurement in the set-top boxes. Hajia Sa Ibrahim is the vice chairman of the Broadcast Organization of Nigeria, BORN. But at this event, she's standing in for the organization's chairman, Mr. John Momo, who wants the government to reel out impactful policies for the full takeoff of the digitization process in the country. We urge the Broadcasting Commission to come out clearly on the timeline of digital switchover, which must include fees payable by licenses, compensation to the organization whose equipment will be taken over, who will benefit from the spectrum that will be sold since licenses currently have paid for them and will also pay for them during the digitization process. <laughs> All return after the short tea break and a panel discussion is set. The topic before these panelists is evaluating the roles and responsibilities of the different players in the new broadcasting ecosystem. We actually can give directives to stations, for instance, that a particular piece of music should not be broadcast. It is NTV in the broadcast panel, sorry. Then working together with the licenses and the Advertising Practitioners Council of Nigeria and the NBC, we can then say an advert is also in TBB. For as long as you do not pay the, the stations their legitimate revenue, so you won't be able to hop from one station to the other and play on the fact of vulnerability of, of the stations. You know, we still need to manufacture a set of boxes. But in the order of uh, arrangement, who comes first, who follows, who makes those contractual agreements in the value chain? Because I think uh, we've doubled down in over-regulating the process as a business process. And, and because of that, there is no real order. As a signatory to the International Broadcast Union Agreement of 2006, Nigeria must yield to the switchover to digital terrestrial television. But there are a host of challenges facing the switch, and that's particularly in the value chain, from the regulators to the consumers. The value chain in our process has been broken down in such a way that the transmitting systems or the transmitting companies who are distribution companies now stand alone and only do one single activity without being able to say less commercialized activity of bringing the, the
the content from broadcasters and then transmitting uh, at the other end. But as we speak, that isn't the case. Now, because it's private sector driven and you have to invest upfront, who would do that knowing that you'll be struggling to get back your money? Players in the industry expect the digitization to make room for more creativity and media content while providing employment for the teeming unemployed populace if it's well structured and applied. Loretta Chiogo, Channels Television News. When the news at 10 returns, Nigeria's central bank governor seeks closer relationship with financial sector regulators to ensure growth and stability in the country's economy. Join us again.